Okay, this is segment two for Friday, and we are discussing disorders, and we're looking at uh, attempts to prevent disorders, and we're discussing tertiary, which tries to help with the transition to the real world after the release from mental institutions. Unfortunately, because of the lack of money that's spent in mental health, a lot of people who are treated in mental institutions are, in essence, dumped out into society with the hope that they'll continue to take their medication but very little assistance, very little follow-up. It's very much like taking somebody from prison and just dumping them into society without any kind of help, which is probably something that if we would pay a little more attention to in mental illness would be something that would uh, help therapies and treatments to be much more successful. Finally, let's look at uh, some other issues that we'll uh, consider concerning therapies. One of them is the question of whether or not there should be different treatment regimens or different treatment approaches for patients who are male or patients who are female. This actually relates to some of the information we've looked at in some of the other issues we've discussed in both disorders and therapies and how there is difference between men and women in the types of ailments that we see and also the severity and how they affect each gender. Now is the difference big enough to make the approach different when it comes to therapies and treatment? There is a huge debate about that and it continues to go on uh, uh, at this moment and it's something that I think as we do further and further research into how the brain works may be answered, but then again it may just be something that we see as a potential difference. Also differences to take a look at would be differences in culture. What's interesting here is that you find the cultural differences that we see in both cognition and behavior and expectations and social attitudes. We also see when it comes to the treatment of mental illness. Uh, in fact, one of the examples of this is that there are differences in the standard dosages for different countries when it comes to particular medication. There's also differences in what is considered to be normal behavior, and of course that is, affects what physicians then prescribe for different ailments, and in fact how they look at those ailments themselves. So, as I've told you before, one of the uh, constant criticisms of psychology in the United States is its Western bias. But it is interesting that just the differences in culture can actually influence in how they actually look at medication, which medications they choose, and how much of it they tend to use. So this closes the, the therapies part of uh, this segment, and we're now going to move to social psychology. Okay, this is social psychology, the final chapter in the book, and maybe one of the most interesting, and it's how we judge and or evaluate other people. Uh, something to consider. Do first impressions matter? Absolute, absolutely. We've talked about it before. We automatically assign a person to a category or a schema in our minds. This is even more important because of how your memory works with patterns or schemas. Research shows that people tend to hear and remember what they expect to about the people that they run into. So the uh, preconceived notions that we have can sometimes become self-fulfilling prophecies. We've talked a lot about all of this, but when you meet somebody new, you will take a couple of uh, parts of the way they look or the things that you pick up about them and use them use that as the basis for your categorization. And once you categorize them, it takes a lot to change that category. We've talked all about that many times. The primacy effect is that idea that it's hard to overcome either good or bad initial views because of the way that the brain works. So this is the self. This brings about the self-fulfilling prophecy and the Pygmalion effect. Um, it also brings up the idea of stereotypes, which are a set of characteristics that are in the minds of in the mind of someone are characteristics that are shared by all members of a particular social category or group. There's an interesting study here um, about categorization and how our brains work. Um, when people were uh, in a sub in a, an experiment were asked to listen to uh, people talk to them on the phone, when they were given a particular picture of the person, they change their view of whether that they like that person or what they thought about them depending upon how the picture looks. So we take the image that we get and although the people on the phone, it was the same person on the phone each time, the different picture uh, caused people to uh, give different feedback about the, 
the person that they were listening to. And another thing that we're about to get into is that the more attractive the person was rated, the more positive the feedback that the subjects gave about the person that was speaking on the other end of the phone. One hopeful sign, however, is that sorting people into categories is not inevitable when it comes to the human brain and our view towards others, although it is definitely more likely in a chance encounter because you have to make a quick decision and uh, move forward. Next term we'll talk about is a very important one in social psychology, and that's attribution. And that's how we explain the behavior of others or what we attributed to. And what we attributed to strongly affects our view of that person, especially if we attribute their behavior to internal or external focuses. So the question is, do we think that what other people do is based on their own internal characteristics, or is it something that affects them from outside? To make this decision, we rely upon three kinds of information to determine the cause of someone's behavior. First, it's distinctiveness. Second, it's consistency. And third, consensus. Here's an example. Your instructor asks you to speak to him or her after class. Now, while you're sitting in class and waiting for class to end, you'll try to figure out what's behind the request by the instructor. You'll probably ask these three questions. One, does the instructor often ask others to do this? So is it distinctive? Number two, does the instructor often ask you to do this? Is this something that's consistently happened? And number three, do other instructors ask you to do this? That would be consensus. So uh, as a thought question, you might think a little bit about how cognitive dissonance might be a motivator in your own mind until class is over. So attribution includes research that shows we have many biases when making an attribution. And of course, one of the first ones and one of the most important is what is called the fundamental attribution error. And that's the idea that we almost inevitably default to the idea that if somebody does something and they're not successful at it, that it's the, it's, the problem is within them. That's the fundamental attribution error. Uh, rather than being something from the environment causing them to behave the way that they do. An offshoot of this is the so-called actor-observer effect, and that's blaming uh, internal factors for other people's behavior. But if something goes wrong for you, you will always say that it's external factors that cause it. It's nothing within you that makes that happen. A related class of biases are called defensive attributions. We tend to portray ourselves in our mind and to others in the best light possible. We've talked about this before. This is how your memory actually works. An example of this is something called self-serving bias. We see our own personal failure as being forced on us by environmental factors, but we see our personal success as being something that kind of comes up from within us. It's because we are a good person. Um, this actually, you can think about this uh, having an effect on explanatory styles and optimism and pessimism too, uh, being part of this entire nexus. Another example of uh, attribution is something called the just world hypothesis. This is the idea that the world is just, so bad things happen to bad people, good things happen to good people. And this is something that you'll definitely find, especially when people are looking at uh, those that they see in a group other than the the one that they be believe that they belong to. So interestingly, there is cultural variance on how different cultures attribute situations. There is variance, and for instance, East Asians see most behavior that people uh, show or choices that they make, uh, they see those attributable to external situations and factors. In the West, like our culture, we're more likely to see behavior as internal than people who might be from an Asian culture would see it. And again, this probably reflects once again the difference between the communal culture of uh, that you'll find in Asia versus the more independent or individualistic culture you'll find in the United States. Okay, we're going to skip over interpersonal attraction because we'll talk, be talking about that in class on Friday. So let's uh, scroll down to attitudes. What are they and where do they come from? The definition of an attitude is a relatively stable organization of beliefs, feelings, and tendencies as you look at an, another person or an object. Uh, the relationship between attitudes and behaviors is not always evident. 
the strength of attitude makes a difference. So do personal traits. Some people override their own attitudes in a given situation. People who rank high in self-monitoring are more likely to override their attitude. By self-monitoring we mean uh, considering themselves in relationship to others, how they affect others, how others affect them, focusing a little more inward. Um, and so people who are high, rank high in that are more likely to override their attitudes and to listen to others. They definitely focus on situational cues and that can affect their attitudes. Where do we get attitudes? Many of them are from direct environmental experience, so this would be something the behaviorists would be very supportive of. We also get them from imitation. A lot of times we'll pick up through modeling uh, attitudes and ideas from other people. Connected to attitudes is of course are of course the terms prejudice and discrimination. Now prejudice is an attitude or being prejudicial is an attitude often related to strong emotions but discrimination is an actual behavior so there's a difference between the two. Sources of prejudice or prejudging things include something called the frustration aggression theory and this is the idea that people get frustrated over being picked on by others and so they'll focus their anger on what they consider to be a group that has lower status than themselves and then a second form or a second basis for prejudicial behavior is an authoritarian authoritarian personality this is somebody who has suspicious mistrust of human life and rigid adherence to rules so either one of these is a major source of people prejudging others now as a little side note the brain is set up to prejudge others however the question is how do we respond to that and again there's uh, there are different things that can change your attitudes including prejudice and discrimination next a little bit on persuasion now we've discussed this already in class and actually did an activity on it but the question is how do advertising advertisers and others change our attitudes to, in order to persuade us we must first pay attention to the message, comprehend the message, and accept it as convincing. Uh, comprehending it and accepting it are influenced by the message itself and how it's presented. The communication model of persuasion spotlights four key elements on that influence whether we can be persuaded. First, the source. Do we find it to be credibility um, and sometimes are credible? Do we find the source to be credible? Uh, to get in order to get beyond our inclination not to pay attention to the message so if the source is credible sometimes we'll pay attention to it number two the message um, something like the the celebrity spokesman might help here but one of the messages that sometimes works is fear but you can't go too far with that and showing both sides of an argument also can help the third one the medium of communication face-to-face -face or lessons of our own experience work best rather than being told about things and fourth the characteristics of the audience have an influence on whether persuasion happens some audiences and our view of our own, ourselves within those audiences may make us more pliable to messages uh, and so the audience that you are in and the audience you think you're part of has an influence. We've discussed cognitive dissonance at great detail. Just remember it as that unpleasant psychological tension and that it was Leon Fessinger's research, the very boring activity and people having to say that it was exciting was the issue with this, the cognitive dissonance, the well-known experiment on it. Next question, how does social influence affect our views? How do others affect our perceptions, behaviors, and so forth? One factor, of course, is culture. Shared beliefs and values you have with others, including te uh, technology and technologies and criteria for evaluating the world around us. An example is how you dress, what you eat, how you view personal space. Big influences are cultural truisms, and these are general beliefs that people connect to their own culture. Things like democracy is best would be a cultural uh, truism. Is that true or not? Well, our culture definitely believes it, but it's one of the things that's the basis for our entire culture and many things come from that. Through our culture we also pick up social norms through social learning. These are culturally shared ideas about how to behave 
or not to behave. We'll pick up with conformity in class. So this is the end of segment two.